parking space, there's gonna be demand to put that car in another parking space somewhere else. And then the road in between is always gonna to have to get wider to accommodate more cars. The more parking on one end, the more parking on the other, wider roads in between. Parking is also physically bad for the climate and for uh, climate change and our, our just climate issues, exacerbates them. Most parking structures are built out of concrete, very carbon intensive building material. Surface lots like this one back here cause heat islands. And then in the heat, in the, in the warm months and in the rainy months, they cause local flooding and massive pollution to rivers and streams in the ocean. Every new parking space is an invitation and an expectation that someone is going to drive every day, probably by themselves, into the neighborhood where the parking space is built and then drive away to another parking space on ever widening roads. So how did they get here? Like, why do we have this much parking? And I'll just give an example here. So from here to the Hawthorne Bridge in the 1940s was all buildings, nonstop. No, there was no parking lots here but now today you go look there's parking lots all over the place and why well we started building wider roads and freeways to get people into downtown sometime in the 50s and 60s tore down buildings because if you wanted to put an office in one building you had to tear down the building next door and put a parking lot there so people could drive there more people drive into downtown then they're driving home they need a parking space at home so we started requiring parking in every house every apartment needed more parking it spread things out further the city spread tore down more buildings, built more freeways, then started requiring, well, everyone's already driving here and there. We need parking at every land use. We need parking at a grocery store. We need parking at the movie theater. We need parking at the bowling alley, which all across the country, five spaces per lane is pretty much an average amount of parking you have to provide at a bowling alley. Still in most places today. And all that parking takes up money. It costs a lot of money and it takes up a tremendous amount of space. So how much does it cost? About a block and a half over here, NATO and Davis Smart Park parking garage. A year and a half ago, Peabot was considering adding 392 parking spaces to that garage. The price tag, they already own the land, $18 million, $45,000 per parking space, right? And that's about, that's not the highest, it's not the lowest, but for around here, that's not bad. I mean, it's bad, but it's not like the most. And underground parking, which a lot of people think is a solution, costs even more. That's easily $50,000 of space. And I've heard over by the Southwest Waterfront, OHSU, because you have water intrusion, spaces cost almost $100,000. A space, one parking space. So how does this impact things? How does this, give, how does this stop us from making the, the, the progress we need to make? Well, let's talk about housing a little bit. You want to build a park, if you want to build an apartment and we're requiring a parking space per apartment, if, if the parking space costs $50,000 under the apartment, someone's got to pay for that. So it's A, it's going to make for less housing because they're not going to be able to build as much. But then it costs about $500 a month to pay for a $50,000 parking space. Now, usually no one's paying $500 a month separate from their rent. So what does that mean? Who's paying for it? Everyone's paying for it, whether they're in the apartment, whether they own a car or not. The space in housing, if you have to build parking, for every apartment. You can't fill this, fit as many homes on a lot. So it means we have less homes in the areas where it's walkable and, we, and people shouldn't own a car. But if you're requiring parking where pe or if you're demanding parking where people are living, you're preventing the kinds of cities and built environment we need to combat climate change. And it's not obviously not just housing, shopping and retail. Every time you go to a grocery store, almost every grocery store is surrounded by a parking lot, right? When you pay for your groceries, you're paying for part of that parking lot, whether you own a car, whether you drove there or not. And it makes it harder to even get to the grocery store. It's farther from the bus stop. It's farther from the curb. It's farther from your home. That's the parking, spreading everything out. And that's the real costs, right? That's the real money, the cash and the space. But there's opportunity costs too. Opportunity costs, what you could have done instead of spending that money on parking. What you could have built instead of putting that space for parking. So here's an example of this. In Stamford, Connecticut, I read an article last week, they're building a park and ride, which a lot of people think that's good, a park and ride. Park and ride at a transit center, 930 parking spaces, costs $81.7 million, $88,000 a parking space. And that's, this is one of the wealthiest communities in the entire country, Stamford, Connecticut. So you're talking 
That's to shorten the commute of one person, to shorten the commute. It's a park and ride. They're still driving to the park and ride, right? So who knows how far they're driving? They're still on the roads. They're going from their parking space to another one, widening roads in between. If, you were, if I gave any of you $88,000 and said, how many people can you convince to not drive to work with $88,000? And what would you do with it? I would hope no one would come and say, I'm gonna build a parking space near the transit station for one person. It's not gonna work. Suggest you build housing by the transit station is my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and the opportunity costs, thank you. For space too, right? Like the roads, not just housing, but the roads. All these spaces taken up by cars on the roads. It could be bus lanes, bike lanes, bike parking, street seats, street trees, food trucks. You could have narrower roads with housing, more housing on them. But what is it? It's parking that's usually free. Now, this chain reaction I mentioned, still happening, still happening today, of a parking space here, needs a parking space there, needs a wider road in between. I have a very local example. Across the river, by the Max station at the convention center and the Rose Quarter, where the freeway is, is a new parking structure they built, like two years ago. 477 stalls next to the hotel. It's the convention center hotel. Cost $32 million, but it's not fair to divide it because there's also a TriMet jail in that building. So we'll say it's $60,000 of parking space to be nice. You take the max red line to the end. Where are you? You're at the airport. If anyone's been to the airport recently, I know it's probably not too much, but they've been building during pandemic a very, very big parking structure there. 2,500 parking spaces. It's a park, parking and rental car center. Costs about $200 million, right? It's on the other end of that. Now, this is a, a hotel convention. It's for conventions. So people are coming from out of town. So what are we thinking? They're flying into the airport. They're renting a car at the new garage. They're driving down these roads and freeways. They need to get wider and wider all the time to get to the other parking on the other end. And they could just take the max. Now, in the T2020, the, the transportation bond last year that failed, there was a project in that bond to build a flyover. It's basically widening airport way at 82nd Avenue to get these cars from the airport to the convention center. They said it was a trans transit project because it was to stop blocking the max. But if you don't build the parking garages, you don't need to build the flyover because you don't have the cars that are blocking the max. And think about these agencies that are building these garages. The convention center garage was partly Metro was involved. Prosper Portland was involved, right? A lot of agencies involved in that. The airport quasi-public, it's the Port of Portland. They all have climate plans. They tell you they're working on climate action. They tell you they want cars to be reduced, but they have to pay for those garages. Remember, you build a garage, you're inviting and expecting someone. You need someone to park in that space every day for 30 years to pay your bills for the parking garage. So how are you, where's push comes to shove? If it's, I'm gonna reduce car trips, or I'm gonna pay my bills, what are you gonna do? You're gonna pay your bills. Even the city of Portland downtown, $30 million a year downtown meter rates, money goes into the general fund. When it push comes to shove, are we serious about climate action, or are we serious about keeping the budget going? It's a conflict of interest. That flyover, by the way, $87 million, 35 of it was supposed to come out of the taxes can't fight climate change without transportation, right? Without fixing transportation. And this is a hydra. So this is where I really wanna engage you because you're doing great work fighting the freeway. But you can't just cut off the freeway. You have to cut off the parking supply. And you have to cut off the fuel supply, the fossil fuel infrastructure. We have to attack all these things at once. We have to build better cities and safer streets for people to get around. Now, I want to address some, there's possibly, you know, like equity concerns, okay, because that's a helicopter going to the free helicopter parking, I, I'm not even lying on top of the NATO and Davis parking garage where they were going to build it. Um, so when you talk about building less parking or charging more for parking, there are valid concerns people have. They say, what about, you know, low income people? What about people with disabilities? What about people who their job requires driving. I'm not saying because they live far away and they need to drive to work necessarily, but their job requires driving. How do we, what about 
older people, you know? And first, you gotta ask, a lot of these people don't own cars that they're, they're claiming this for. You know, a lot of low-income people don't own cars. A lot of people with disabilities can't drive cars, you know, but, but that's the, the claim. But there's some solutions to this, and I wanna point this out because it's important. If there's a lot of parking already, and it's not, it, you know, as I mentioned, you build a parking space, it's there, especially underground one, it's there forever. So there's a lot of parking we already have in our cities and in our built environments. So if we're serious about addressing these equity concerns, you know, we can allocate all the, we can use the parking we have better. We can allocate all that parking only for the use of these people we're concerned about. You can mention that to someone, they probably won't take you up on the offer, but that's the solution. Or if you're worried about how much it costs, you know, now some people might say, well, we'll give discounts to low-income people. But that only helps low-income people have cars. I say, redistribute the wealth, charge rich people to park, and then give the money as cash to low-income people. Woo! <laughs> yep. Oh. First and foremost, the chicks that get raped need showers. Start with that. That's also like, true. Parking and shit is like that. You're, you're That's where the city's spending a bunch of money on, though. There's, we there's should. Raping uh, chicks all over the place, yeah. and they can't even get showers, and the cops don't come, and the ambulance doesn't come. You got a long way to go. Hey, I, I, I hear you. Problems. Thirty million dollars they collect here. Yeah, they no, could spend I, it on I, that. I, 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 Anything I, I, but parking. Being nice to each other issue and caring about each other, and it's it gets a long way to parking, though. I'll tell you that. Uh, uh, well, that's all around. I mean. I mean, we, I love you for doing what you're doing. I, I build housing really on parking lots. Much more fundamental. That is an opinion, and it's about. I mean, I, there are. This is. It's a wonky subject, but it is. I think actually, a core of a lot of our how we got in the situation we are here today is from misusing our land and our priorities about transportation. That's part of it for sure. There's a lot of deeper issues. I can't solve them all. Uh, but I did want to say, you know, give that money, you know, redistribution of wealth, uh, how we spend the money from collecting these fees is critically important, improve transit, make streets safer for people. That's the answer. And, 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 and it's not just building more and more parking so people can park for free while everyone else pays for it. So I'm almost done. Um, what, do, what, you know, now that you know about this, what can we do? I think obviously you keep up the pressure on not building the freeway because we need less parking if there's less cars in general and less roads. Speak out about parking when you see it being built a lot of places. There's, th there's some things happening still. The post office redevelopment, which is a few blocks from here, there's a lot of parking that's planned to be built in the post office blocks. So you wanna build 2,000 spaces downtown in 2025 or whenever that gets built, well, you're expecting for the next 30 years, 2,000 more cars to drive into this neighborhood from somewhere where they're gonna to have to build more parking and widen the roads in between. Over at the Lloyd Center, it's gonna get redeveloped. There's already a lot of parking there. What's gonna happen with it? Are they gonna keep it all? Are they gonna build more? Who knows? So pay attention to that. There's uh, opportunities locally. Uh, last, last month we passed a, uh, a thing here in Portland, Pricing Options for Equitable Mobility, POEM. It's a framework that aims to raise revenue for hopefully good things by largely charging for parking. And in the next year, PBOT's working on that, they're gonna come back and they're gonna need to hear from people that this is a good idea because a lot of people are gonna be mad when you tell them they have to pay a little more for their parking. Push back on blowback. When some building gets built in your neighborhood, the knee-jerk reaction if there's no parking in it is to complain about how the parking's gonna be on the street. But now you know how much parking costs, right? You know it's like $50,000. You know that adds a lot to the rent. You know how much space it takes up. You know that every morning at 7 a.m., if, if I build 100 apartments and then I build 100 parking spaces, that's 100 cars I'm inviting into my neighborhood every day. So when I go to school or to work, that's 100 cars trying to kill me on my bike, right? And then they're going somewhere else to park, so in between, the whole way they're there on ever-winding roads, they're trying to run people over. So I hope I've shared with you this kind of dark side of what you see, you know, every parking garage, every parking space, you know, it's like parking is a fertility drug for cars. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> and every space you build, you know, it makes it harder and harder to fight climate change because every car that's bought, every car that's brought into your community is just, it's, it's digging a deeper hole on this issue. So now you know about it, I hope you engage with it. You have a kind of responsibility now when someone complains about parking to maybe push back a little bit on this. Um, 
Thank you so much. My name's Tony Jordan. My website's parkingreform.org, and I, I'm happy to talk to anybody. Yeah, give it up for Tony. That was that was awesome. I thought I talked about cars a lot, but man, um, he's just yeah. getting started. He's just getting started. That's true. Um, yeah. If anyone has any questions for Tony or wants to check out his parking reform network, it is fantastic. I know he. It's like across the country at this point, trying to get parking reform into every city so that we can start talking about this serious issue. Um, fertility, fertility drug for cars, I love that. <laughs> Two billion parking spaces in Oregon. Two billion parking spaces in Oregon. With the B. Eight for every car. Eight for every car? And some, it's, it's some estimates. Yeah. Estimates, at okay. Least, at least three, some point in, Jack, in, Jackson Hole, Wyoming, there's 22 or maybe 28 per car. These it are great. It depends, you know, so, but yeah, there's a lot. Wow, so that's 22 or 28 per car in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. <laughs> How many spots do you need for a car? I think you just need one and it's while well, it's waiting to get crushed. That's uh, that's the future I want to see. Um, anyway, since Commissioner Hardesty is not here tonight, we had to kind of scratch our heads. What are we going to do with the rest of this time and hopefully to entertain y'all. Um, so first I want to announce the really exciting news. Um, tomorrow, five Sunrisers are going to have an in-person meeting with Sen Senator Ron Wyden. Um, yeah, it's it's really cool for our first in-person meeting since the pandemic began uh, with an elected official. We met with a few on Zoom, but everyone knows it's not the same over Zoom. Um, so among other things, we're going to talk about Senator, talk to Senator Wyden about being a little more vocal about the fact that he believes we can cover I-5 in the Rose Quarter without expanding the freeway. Uh, we're gonna ask him to champion that for us so that we don't have to let ODOT do it because we know what they're gonna do. Um, so this shows our continued advocacy works. Being out here for 15 sessions works. Like this, it works. The system isn't as broken as uh, I used to believe. And I think some of us might still believe. Um, I'm, I'm a big believer that if you if you don't voice your opinion in the system we have, it doesn't matter. Um, you can keep it in your head. You can talk to your friends all you want, but you, I, I've experienced this. I've called the office of my representatives multiple times, and I've talked to the people that are working in their office, and I asked them, "Does this matter? Like, does my voice matter? The fact that I'm calling into you?" And they say, "It does. It's good to know that people from this part of the state believe this, so that we can actually make policy out of that." Um, and I've met a lot of people who feel kind of jaded and sad and feel like it doesn't matter. So if everyone here or as many of you as possible would like to, since we're meeting with Ron Wyden in person, we're thinking it'd be nice to hand deliver him some letters. Um, and we got letter writing supplies. So the goal here is to, to tell Ron Wyden, you know, <laughs> I think they do too, but yeah. I got that from Ron Wyden in 1980. We're gonna wait for the train to pass. Yay trains! Yeah, yay trains! It would be, yeah, but trains only honk when they park or when they cross at Great Crossing, so we just don't need any of those. Um, before I get into my spiel about letter writing, um, Micah would like to lead a song. In Sunrise we sing, um, it builds community, and it's fun to sing, and no one does it enough. So, Micah? Yeah. Hello, my name is Micah, and I like to sing. Do you like to sing? Okay, if you don't like to sing, just bear with me, okay? We're gonna have a good time. Um, so the theme of the letter writing is to tell Senator Wyden what it's like to be, a, you know, a person in this world experiencing climate change, specifically an Oregonian, specifically a Portlander or in the Portland Metro, 
Um, and not just to say, you know, what it's like to live under the burden of knowing that our system is going to collapse and that all of the things that we've built are going to fall around us, but also that we have a real opportunity here that we're standing at a turning point where we can change what our infrastructure looks like, we can change who governs our systems, and we can change how we're in relationship to the land. And so we're really encouraging you guys to write about the transition that you want to see, right? The infrastructure that you want to see built. The vision of a world that would be healthy for you, for your family, for your community, for your neighbors, for strangers, for cultures that you're not a part of. Ways that we can all live on this stupid earth. So, um, this song is called Forget Your Perfect Offering and it's a call and, it's a call and response. So we're going to try it out. I go, call! And you go, response! Call! Response! Call! Response! Call! Response! Forget your perfect offering! Forget your perfect offering! Just ring the bells that still can ring! Just ring the bells that still can ring! There is a crack in everything! There is a crack in everything! That's how! How! The lie! The lie! Gets in! That's how the lie gets in! That's how! The lie! Gets in, that's how the light gets in. Forget your perfect offering. Forget your perfect offering. Just ring the bells that still can ring. Just ring the bells that still can ring. There is a crack in everything. There is a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. 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 All right, we have used our Youth versus ODOT um, banners as clipboards today, so please make sure you give them back. They are super good pieces of cardboard that we made. Yeah, thank you, Micah. Um, great song, good job, everyone. Also, I want to thank all the adults who are out here tonight. This is the most adult supporters I've seen my entire time coming. Um, I don't know if that's because we're meeting at a little later time or, or because Tony was going to talk tonight. Um, not sure, but please keep coming out here. We love the support and we love the continued support. It does not work without all of you being here. Um, you we're going to change the time Ryan? again. I don't know what to, we're but in tomorrow. two weeks. Okay or so we're gonna have another one of these um anyway micah's got a bunch of clipboards and pens and an envelope right as much or as little as you'd like and there's unfortunately not enough for everyone to get one so when you're done go ahead and bring it back to myself or micah um i'll be with the bag i'll be up here um and i'll yeah then we'll have some more letter writing fun um, anyway, I'll, I'll ask Dan to put on some nice music for us all. Thanks, everyone. Music time.